I need some traction. You need some traction. Exit software companies for more than two decades. He's served as a CFO at Shopify, FreshBooks, was GP at Real Ventures, investing in awesome companies, and then ran one of the top investment banks focused on SMB software, SurePath. And what people, many people don't know, and probably Mark, if you've not dropped the link, I will, is he, Mark DJs. And, and what I would recommend is maybe the next time we do this session, we do like a social where Mark's DJing. I dropped his SoundCloud link. Mark, before we get started and go into this topic, this really hot topic that nobody talks about is like, there is no boss for founders or CEOs, right? Like everyone else gets all this coaching, but founders and CEOs don't. And they have this external pressure, investor pressure, team pressure, and they got to always look like they're at the top of the game. And we die under this pressure and this stress as founders, right? And, um, and so before we get into that topic of how do you build high-performing companies and build, become a high-performing founder, CEO, leader, I would love to learn a little bit more of your backstory. How did you go from like being CFO to investing and now doing what you're doing? And all this while keeping your passion alive of belting out some awesome tunes there. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Lloyd. Uh, yeah, thanks for the intro, and uh, yeah, super pumped to be here, folks, and look forward to getting into this chat. Yeah, briefly on, on my background and that journey, I guess. So, you know, I'm a CPA by training. I spent six years in that world, uh, three in audit, which is as boring and painful as you can imagine, uh, three in corporate finance that was better, and um you know, corporate finance was my first exposure to doing deals. And I entered the startup world in 1999. And at the time, I thought I was just really great at fundraising. Turns out anyone with a pulse was able to raise capital. But I, you know, I had a thirst for deals. And um, startups were just a perfect hunting ground for that because, you know, they're always kind of burning their way to greatness and always need capital and, you know, always looking to exit. And um, was really enamored with uh, venture capital and kind of set myself a goal to become a VC within 10 years. I uh, did it in 11. Um, I, for you know reasons we can get into or not, depending on our time, I think venture capital is overblown. It gets too much press, too much attention. It actually doesn't apply well to most companies. And um, I also think it's it's overrated even as a as an industry, and so uh, for all those reasons, I stopped being a VC. But recognized that um, you know startup life boils down to a few big moments uh, where having the right expertise, connections, insights, deal making capability can be literally game changing. And so felt that there was a gap in in terms of advising companies on doing these deals. And I think investment banks have a well deserved bad reputation. Most investment banks and most investment bankers are useless. And so I didn't think the world needed just another generic investment bank. And I thought the only way to matter was to specialize. And so we went super deep on a space that I knew really well, which was uh, SMB SaaS and, and built arguably kind of a leading deal maker in that space. So it's just been a natural evolution focused on a, a true passion for doing deals and a true passion for kind of advising uh, CEOs, which is a thing I'm, I'm going to get into in the, the talk. And, and as for the music thing, I don't know, that's, that's a whole other thing, but uh, that's just been a lifelong passion. Um, something I'm going to talk about in this chat is actually the importance of fun, uh, which I think a lot of us adults forget about. And for me, uh, playing music, whether it's DJing back when people used to go out or whether it's producing music, um, it just completely feeds my soul. Um, I could do it, like I just lose myself for hours at a time. I stop thinking. Uh, so it just is something I absolutely am compelled to do. And I think it's really important for us to have those things in our lives. Uh, Cause I think it gives us so much energy, uh, you know, to bring to the other parts of our lives. So I could do a whole talk on music, uh, but, uh, but we'll save that for another time. Okay. Awesome. Without further ado, Mark, take it away. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is what I call uh, 360 degree leadership. And uh, I'll get into what that means, but really kind of building sustainable personal practices and sustainable business practices for, for peak performance uh, and peak performance, meaning across all of your roles, not just peak performance for the business, but peak performance for yourself 
as a human being. Uh, I'll do a super fast intro because Lloyd's covered that today. Uh, and then I'm going to get into, you know, seven personal practices that I think lead to kind of peak and sustainable personal performance and do the same on, on the business side. So seven, uh, what I think are kind of company leadership practices for sustainable peak performance. And uh, I know we're a large group. Uh, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. Uh, there's an hour for this chat. Uh, I will not take a full hour. Uh, and so there'll be lots of time at the end to, to go through your questions. Uh, so very briefly, um, Mark McLeod, I've been in the venture back startup world since 1999. Uh, spent 14 years as CFO for a number of venture back software companies, uh, most notably Shopify. I was there for a brief but instrumental period kind of through the Series A and then the internal uh, Series B. Um, uh, FreshBooks, where I led uh, finance, biz dev, and corp dev. In between those two, I was one of the original general partners in Real Ventures, which was and still is uh, Canada's largest independent seed stage venture fund. Spent five years founding and running Surepath Capital Partners, a leading boutique investment bank for SMB software. And for just a, about a year now, have been uh, serving as a coach and advisor uh, to the CEOs of venture and private equity backed uh, startups. Um, and we've also covered the most important thing, which is I'm hugely passionate about electronic music, specifically uh, Deep House. Uh, so let's just set the table. And before we get into, you know, these practices that I recommend, let's just talk about the context that you guys are, are all operating in, particularly if you've done what uh, Lloyd and his partners have done and, you know, actually just raised from capital. So let's talk about 360 leadership as a starting point. As I mentioned at the very beginning, 360 is about all of you. Um, not just, you, you know, you are not just a CEO. You are, you know, a spouse or a partner. You are maybe a parent. Uh, we're all children. Um, you know, we wear, we wear many different hats and they're all kind of intertwined. If things are kind of falling apart in your personal life, you cannot possibly show up and crush it in your work life, at least not for the long run and kind of vice versa. So it's all, it's all kind of one thing. And, you know, what I am talking about with this is bringing the same level of kind of intention and purpose and vision to all of the roles that you bring to your role as, as a company leader. So, you know, if you look at, I've been a student of kind of high growth software companies for a long time now, and, and what do these folks have in common? So Toby from Shopify, Mark from Salesforce, Mikkel from Zendesk, so on and so on. First of all, they're all male. Uh, that's a, an unfortunate thing, and that's a separate topic for another time. But they have led, they are all kind of original founding CEOs and have, you know, led the company from the, the inception of the company to now. And this is a common pattern you see where, you know, all the biggest outcomes tend to be a founder led start to finish. So more or less a hundred percent correlation between your performance as a CEO and the outcome for your company. So the stakes are high. And, uh, you know, this is something I've, I've recognized pretty early in my startup career and uh, is actually sort of my purpose, you know, whether I was like a, a CFO serving as a right hand to a CEO, trying to give that person maximum leverage, whether I was a VC investing in CEOs or a deal maker trying to help them achieve biggest outcomes, I recognized just a huge correlation between that person's performance and the company outcome and therefore just wanted to give that person kind of maximum leverage. So this is like a, there used to be a time, you know, when I first got into the space where, you know, founders would take it so far and then the VCs would quote unquote bring in professional management. And I think everyone now recognizes that that's not necessarily kind of required or, or even beneficial. Uh, and as they've seen now, as kind of the internet has played out over, you know, a meaningful number of years, that these biggest outcomes are not the ones actually where, you know, the MBAs have been brought in, but are actually ones where the founders have scaled and, and transformed themselves and continued to be as relevant in the later stages as they were at the very beginning. 
And, you know, no surprise, uh, good things take time. You know, if we read TechCrunch too much, we think that companies kind of go from start to finish and sell for like, I don't know, 300 million bucks in, in four years. But that's absolutely not the case. You know, these are just a few logos that I'm sure we all know well. You know, Shopify has been around since 2004, FreshBooks a year earlier. Even some of these companies that are still private have been around, you know, for, for many, many years. And so the reality is kind of, like I say, good things, you know, take time. Those kind of super fast exits do happen, but they're extraordinarily rare. And so you have to build a set of practices for yourself that are gonna allow you to not blow up and actually kind of not just survive, but actually thrive on every level, on you know, the personal level, professional level over, like, as you can see in this case, you know, in many cases, well over 10 years, uh, because that's what's going to take. If you truly want to build a market leader, build a large transformational company, if you want to do your life's work, you know, buckle up and settle in because it's just going to take some time. In my coaching calls, I often talk about uh, Toby from CEO and you know, I'm guessing most of us on this call are uh, Canadian. And so we can't help but think about uh, Shopify as sort of the ultimate benchmark for what we can achieve. And Shopify's um, year over year growth is a perfect illustration of this kind of virtuous growth cycle. Uh, and, and what I mean by this is for you all, you know, if all of you are kind of, I assume many of you on this call are, are CEOs or otherwise kind of, you know, in a leadership capacity in your companies and you want to transform yourselves and become better leaders, there's lots of things you can do. You can, and you can read lots of great books, lots of great blog posts. You can listen to podcasts. You can get advisors. You can get coaches like myself. All of these things are, are useful. But the one thing, like the single biggest thing that will transform you as a leader is unlocking revenue growth in your startup and then just hanging on for dear life. And, and, as, and this illustration where Shopify kind of in the last five years or six years has gone from kind of 300 million in revenue to 2.9 billion in revenue is a, a perfect illustration of that, you know, where Toby is not the same CEO that he was six years ago. And he has needed to reinvent himself many times over to be as relevant today as he was back in 2015. And, and Toby's going to come up a, a couple of times in this talk, just because I can say for me, he's the benchmark. He's also the most successful CEO that I've spent time and, and worked with. And so there's a lot to learn from him. Um, but, you know, he has talked about, you know, for years, talked about having to re-qualify for his job kind of every year in order to be as relevant 12 months from now as he is today. And so um, this is just, you know, if there's kind of one big nugget about how you can be a better leader, it's having this maniacal focus on removing any and all barriers to increasing the rate of year-on-year -year revenue growth in your company. And lots we can get into there, but that's just you know, one really important observation I've seen over many, many years. So let's get into um, you know, some practices on the personal side you know, for sustainable peak performance. The first is to have the, the right motivation. And you know, it's easier than ever to start companies. You know, when I started in the startup world, in the late 90s, uh, we didn't have Amazon Web Services. You had to spend 3 million bucks on Oracle databases just to get going. We didn't have these open APIs. It was just, there was lots of friction. And now anyone can get started. And in fact, you can launch things with low code or no code. It's a completely different environment. But it is, I would argue, as hard as ever. While it's as easier than ever to start companies, it is as hard as ever to go all the way and build you know, an enduring market leading company. And, and every company, no matter the size, has issues. And so the point of all this is that you need to have the right motivation if you're gonna go all the way. And you know, the startup journey is not kind of a straight line up and to the right, uh, certainly the vast majority of the time. And so there are different kinds of sources of motivation. You know, You might start something because you see a big market. And so there's a big TAM and, and lots of money to be made. 
you might start something because you've built a product that you think is awesome and you want to bring it to market. Um, I would argue that both of those motivations are not truly sustainable through all the ups and downs, you know, that you see here. If you're really just kind of after the money, I don't think money is kind of a sustainable source of motivation uh, and certainly won't be for your staff. Uh, that's for sure. And if you're in love with your product, the risk there, uh, or, you know, in love with the solution that you've built for the market, the risk there is you, you know, start to have a closed mindset and you're just so fixated on what you've built that you kind of don't have an open mind to kind of evolve and kind of yeah, iterate on what you've built to kind of grow and kind of evolve with the market itself. And what I've found is kind of the only truly kind of enduring motivation is to be just completely in love with the problem. You're just so fascinated by the problem that your startup is, you know, pursuing that you just, you'll know, keep working at it. You know, I talked about when Lloyd and I were chatting at the start about how passionate I am about electronic music and I just spend hours and hours and hours on it. I'm completely fascinated by it. I can't learn enough about it. I can't spend enough time on it. It's that kind of uh, motivation that I think gets you through all the inevitable ups and downs in the startup world as well. And there's a, a Japanese concept uh, called Ikigai that you, you may or may not have heard of. But if you find something that the, is at the intersection of what you love, what you're really good at doing, what you can make some money doing, which implies is something that, that the world needs, and you've truly found your sweet spot where you can truly do, you know, your life's work and kind of settle in for the long haul. And so I think this is just a really great um, aim for all of us. Uh, again, whether we're kind of founders or even just, you know, team members within a company, if we can find work that is at the intersection of these four kind of drivers in our life, then I think it ceases to feel like work. It's just sort of our purpose. It's just natural. This is just where we want to spend time. And so the, I, I really, really love uh, this concept of uh, Ikigai. Second personal practice, which is to set kind of intentional boundaries and uh, priorities. As I mentioned before, you know, we wear many different hats. We're not just CEOs. We're not just executives and leaders. We are potentially spouses or partners. We may be parents. Uh, we may be well, we're definitely children. We, we all have parents, uh, whether they're alive or not. And, um, and so there's many, many demands on our time. And what I have found is that work will expand to fill all available time. And if you do not intentionally carve out space for those other roles, if, for instance, your marriage or significant you know, relationship is really, really important to you, but you don't actually carve out time and intention and effort for it, work will just suck up all of that time. Uh, that is that is a hundred percent for sure. And you know, if you look at the success rate of startups, you know, I don't know what the actual stat is, but you know, if you think within like the whole venture model is predicated on if I make 10 investments out of a venture fund, one or two of them are going to be home runs. Maybe two or three, I'll make a double or a single, and the rest, I'll probably lose my money. That's a pretty low success rate. And, um, and so for you all as founders or leaders within companies, just recognize that, hey, this startup may or may not work out. And so at the end of it, when I look back, will I have regrets about um, how I've spent my time? You know, when I look back and say I put every ounce of my attention and effort and energy into this company at the cost of other things that are important to me, my primary relationship, time with family, friends, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and if so, what do I need to do now so that I don't have that regret? And, you know, I can tell you that I, I've lived this uh, personally. One of the catalysts for me uh, shutting down my investment bank and becoming a coach is I got divorced. And, uh, you know, this happens about 50% of the time. Uh, we just grew apart. 
but uh, nevertheless, a material event in my life. And I took the time to look back and reflect on it, on it and learn and figure out what I needed to learn in order to be a, a better human being and, and a better partner. And you know, without getting into all the gory details, I think there were two big takeaways for me that informed that change. Uh, one was this notion, just this observation around work expanding to fill all available time. And you know, work-life balance uh, was just never a strength in any of my roles, whether I was like a CFO scrambling to raise money before a company ran out of cash, um, a VC trying to make a first-time fund a success, or by the way, investment banking. Uh, investment banking is a super intense industry. If you've raised capital before, uh, or sold your company before, imagine doing that all the time for, I don't know, seven deals at a time. So we had offices in Toronto and San Francisco, we had clients in Europe, there was always deals in an intense stage and I was just always on. And my Air Canada status went up every year and you know, it wasn't sustainable. And I found that um, even when I was home, I might've been physically home, but I was not mentally home. I was not fully present. I was checked out. I was either burnt out or stressed or thinking about the deals and planning for my next moves in the next day. And that may resonate with many of you. You may just be so consumed by, you know, trying to make a success out of your startup right now that you find you just don't have the energy and presence to give to your other roles. And, you know, I have learned myself that um, that's an issue, you know, uh, and and I would say, you know, if you do decide to go all in and just commit all of yourself to your role as a startup founder, do so with intention, do so, just own it and know like, okay, I am doing this. I am intentionally setting aside um, these other roles that historic, historically have been important to me and, and, you know, may not be now, uh, just own it and accept it. Don't, you know, you, um, just do it so you have no regrets and, and make sure that it's, you know, it's an intentional uh, decision. So, you know, what are the things that are important to you? You know, if you remember back when people took airplanes and um, there was that message before the little video it plays and it talks about, hey, if you need to put on kind of the oxygen mask, put your, yours on first before you put on the mask for the people you're traveling with. I think that's just a, a great analogy, which is you, you have to feed yourself first. If you're gonna truly be of service, if you're truly going to um, have maximum impact, you have to feed yourself first. So what are the things that feed you? Is it uh, reading? Is it getting out in nature? Is it spending time with family? Um, going back to what I said earlier about work kind of consuming all available time. If you don't intentionally make time for the things that feed you, then you'll have no time to do it because work will consume all available time. And so I, you know, I would say that if you have things that feed you, you know, do them first. Um, and it's easy to say for me now as a coach, because I'm not running a high growth startup, but even when I was running SurePath and doing deals all the time, I, I did that, you know, I'm a, a very passionate CrossFitter. First rule of CrossFit is to always talk about CrossFit. So great, I can check that off now. I've done it. And uh, I would go and train before I came into the office. Um, and uh, that was, you know, just a foundational thing. And I found the days where I did it. I came in, I thought I, I felt better. I thought clearer. I performed better. The days where I didn't, I didn't. You know, I was muddier and it was just harder to think. So um that's just one example of things that feed you, uh, but make, you know, really make uh, time for that. Yeah, so let's talk about time. Um, you know, I hear there's like an ethos in the startup world where like, hey, you know, I'll sleep when I die or people are like bragging on Twitter about working all weekend. And I think that's a bunch of bullshit. And I don't think the solution to um, scaling your startup is just, just keep working um, all the time. I think that, um, and, you know, I talked to many founders who work, you know, somewhere between 60 and 80 hours a week. And I would argue that our bodies and in particular our brains can't really handle that on an ongoing basis. And that the productivity and impact that you're having in hours 50 to 60 
uh, are less than before. And, you know, it's just like a vastly diminishing kind of rate of return. And those last hours, those 70 to 80 hours that you might be putting in a week are just garbage, useless hours. And so, you know, an hour is not an hour is not an hour. It's, uh, it, it's not actually about just putting in more hours. Now, what is the solution? Because again, easy for me to say, you know, we'll get into some suggestions there. But just to point out again, going back to this notion of boundaries, the solution is not necessarily putting in just ever increasing amount of hours. It's changing how you work. It's changing the scope of what you spend time on, uh, et cetera. Third, personal practice, working on your mindset. And um, I, uh, I'm actually gonna spend a, a bunch of time here. I think this is the, the most slides I have are on this one and, and because it's hugely important. You know, perception, is reality. There is no objective reality. We only experience the world through our subjective uh, lens of perception. And, um, you know, do you have a glass half full mindset generally? Do you have a glass half empty mindset that will completely color how you see the world? You know, two CEOs could approach the exact same situation. One of them says, oh, I have to do this. And other than says, oh, I get to do this. They're going to have completely different experiences with the exact same set of objective facts, the exact same set of circumstances. And so mindset is, uh, is almost everything. And um, what I find is, again, because startups are never a straight line. There's always issues. But every day, no matter how hard things are, there's something to be grateful for. Even it's just the opportunity to get to work on it or, you know, the people you get to work with or the problems that you solved that day uh, or the customers that signed up. There's always something to be uh, grateful for. And, and gratitude is really, really powerful, uh, contagious, and is something I really believe in. Um, I'm a Buddhist, and uh, so explicit gratitude practice has been a part of my life for a long time. Um, and, you know, according to Buddhist philosophy, the purpose of life is to be happy. Uh, that in itself is a completely separate topic. So let's park that for the moment. But um, for, for all of you, I, I, you know, I certainly recommend um, carving out some time, ideally at the beginning or the end of the day, uh, or both, to explicitly acknowledge the, the great things that have happened in your life that day. And, you know, I've journaled for most of my adult life. Uh, many of the CEOs I work with um, feel a bit intimidated to just open up a blank page and start journaling. And so a, a book I've recommended to many of them is uh, the five minute journal. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. As the name would suggest, it's, um, you know, kind of a series of guided questions. It's meant to take you no more than five minutes. Uh, but it includes in that explicitly acknowledging the things that you're grateful for. And uh, I, I highly recommend adopting that practice. Um, you know, related to mindset is it's super important to create space in your mind. Uh, uh, again, as a Buddhist, I practice and meditate uh, regularly. Uh, you don't necessarily need to do all of that. But I've included here uh, just some apps that I've tried over time that I think are super helpful to just create some space and meditation practice um, to enable you to just, just be better at life, you know, create more space. You know, we're not designed to go from meeting to meeting to meeting, decision, decision, decision. We're not machines. And so you will actually get more productivity, have more impact on your companies by slowing down a bit and by creating space in your mind so that when you are called upon to make an important decision, you are approaching that decision with maximum clarity and maximum energy. Last thing I'll talk about is uh, worry. Lots of things to be worried about. And Dalai Lama, uh, no surprise, has a very wise take on this. Like, if the thing you're worried about can be solved, then there's no need to worry. You just go ahead and solve it. And if it can't, then again, there's no need to worry because you can't do a thing about it. And so, you know, listen, maybe just keep that phrase in the back of your mind as you're thinking about the never ending list of things that you are maybe worried about. Practice number four, you know, it's really important to connect with your peers. I often joke that, um, and by peers, I mean other founders, other CEOs. Uh, 
I often joke that startups are like um, sausages. You know, they taste good. You just don't want to know how they're made. And, and the fact is, every high growth company from, you know, the newest startup to Shopify and beyond have issues. And what I have found is that uh, technology companies exist in one of two opposite states. They are either struggling to create growth or they're struggling to keep up with growth. There's almost um, no, in, there's no, almost no in between. And uh, there's no one manual, you know, there's no one book. Uh, if there is, someone would have written it and I wouldn't have a coaching practice. And so, you know, super important to get out and talk to others who are going through the same issues uh, that you are, you know, and the fact is the CEO role is a super challenging role. Uh, there are very few people who get the context of that. And, um, uh, you know, many of the CEOs I speak with can't necessarily share everything that they're going through with either their spouses because they don't want to worry them or even their co-founders because, well, for various reasons. And so really, really important to have uh, other folks to talk to. Interestingly, um, almost all of my CEOs are part of some sort of either formal or informal CEO peer group. And so whether that's things like uh, PeerScale uh, here, I don't think they're across Canada, but they're certainly in Toronto. Uh, or just informal networks, that's a great way to kind of have this a trusted space, meaning it's confidential, you can say what's on your mind and know that it's not going to leave the room and, you know, hear the perspective of other CEOs, just, you know, super valuable. Related to this is, you know, to get support. Let's think about the stakes. Um, I find like, you know, again, going back to TechCrunch, you know, you read these headlines all the time and we're just like desensitized, you know, funding rounds get bigger and bigger and bigger and series A rounds today look like series B rounds a few years ago. But if you've just raised, you know, 30 million bucks, uh, your VC is actually expecting to get a minimum of 90 million bucks in return. So the stakes are super high. And so I, the way I think about the CEOs of these high growth venture backed companies is they're almost like professional athletes. And, you know, if you're like LeBron James or you know, whoever else, like you have a team around you, you've got uh, physical therapy coaches, strength coaches, nutrition coaches, uh, sports psychology coaches, you have a whole team around you uh, that is designed to help you kind of achieve maximum performance. And I think it's a similar mindset and a similar investment that's required uh, to, to get the most, um, you know, impact for yourself as a CEO of a venture backed company. Um, you, again, you have to grow faster than your company. Uh, you have to transform yourself many times over. So, you know, I strongly encourage, uh, getting a coach, uh, having an advisors, those are two separate things. Um, and in many cases getting, you know, seeking therapy, these are all kind of interrelated and kind of mutually, uh, supportive things. And, and to really recognize, you know, you're, you're not alone. Uh, like a thing that comes up a bunch uh, in my conversations is imposter syndrome. You know, a feeling like, hey, I'm faking it. I, I, don't, I don't really deserve to be here. People can see through me and see that I don't know what I'm doing. You know, many founders um, are intimidated by the notion of hiring, you know, VP or senior C-level people who are truly kind of subject matter experts in their specific domain. And the fact is, and maybe this is cold comfort, but um, imposter syndrome is universal. You know, even folks that are, have achieved, you know, massive amounts of success experience it because by definition, if you are out there doing something new and you, if you are out where you have never been before, then it's, it's new and it's intimidating and you're always going to feel a little bit of that, but just to recognize that, you know, you can grow faster than your business. And again, to recognize that everyone has experienced this at some point in their life is, uh, is comforting, I find. Practice uh, number six, uh, and I've touched on this a little bit, um, prioritizing, you know, physical health. Uh, you know, the fact is these things, uh, uh, startups are not sprints, they're marathons. Uh, they take a long time. And often we think of ourselves, we identify sort of just with our brains. Like there's so much mental chatter going on. And we just think of us as these like thought and like decision making and communication and machines. And we forget 
that the brain is like a really small part of our body and that most of our body is that it's a physical body and they need to be used in in that proportion uh so what does that mean it means getting some form of physical exercise every day um eating real whole foods um getting a proper sleep um uh, somewhat obsessed with sleep primarily because i'm genetically predisposed to have poor quality sleep so whether it's uh you know there's lots of apps that you know on an apple watch if you have them the aura ring is something i've tried before um sleep is a thing that can be measured and um and tracked uh if you're really fascinated by this there's a book i recommend called why we sleep um and then you know not drinking too much alcohol uh i live in the real world don't recommend that you don't drink at all i i find my alcohol consumption uh, has gone up during these crazy times that we live in uh, but you know not getting carried away with it because it really does have a negative impact uh on sleep uh, and has you know has other kind of consequences as well but you know again we are not uh robots we are not kind of machines producing widgets in a factory and because the startup journey is going to take a long time um we will only be able to thrive over the long term if we take care of of, of ourselves physically last personal practice is to you know explicitly make time for fun and maybe this sounds indulgent and if so that to me just highlights even more the need to do that. You know, when's the last time you explicitly made time to just truly have fun? I recognize in the current environment uh we can't get out, we can't really spend time together, so that's a thing. But, you know, if you think back to the last time you did that, I'll bet you it felt really great. I'll bet you it was energizing and kind of just melted away stress and tension and you just felt better and um um you know true play experiencing true joy i think it's just so restorative uh and so essential it is not an indulgence it is not a luxury it's an absolute essential and and so it's something i i think has to be built into a schedule uh on the regular and and to the extent that you do this i think that it uh is a thing that actually gives you more energy uh more passion to uh more happiness to bring to all of your other roles i think you will be a better ceo a better spouse a better parent a better child if you are truly happy and truly energized uh which you know making time for fun can do for me you know just things that i've done for that uh crossfit's one of them music is another hugely passionate about music have been for my entire adult life um and you know when i settle in to make a track or do a dj set i just completely lose myself i forget about everything that's on my plate and it's just so energizing uh toby again let's go back to toby from shopify you know toby's built a company that did 2.9 billion in revenue last year uh all by by being a really passionate gamer uh and he's always made time for gaming every step of the way um and it's just you know that's his thing and um and it i i would argue that he's it has been part of what has made him you know a a happy productive human being and obviously a hugely successful uh ceo Let's maybe switch gears a little bit and get into some company practices. You know, first and foremost uh is to get the right people on the bus. And by this what I'm really talking about is the senior leaders uh that report to you directly. You know, there's a journey that you go through from founder to CEO where you go from succeeding through individual heroics to succeeding through your team members. And so your senior leadership, that's your leverage. and there's a huge difference between good versus great leaders um when you have great leaders first of all they give you more leverage more impact as a ceo you can spend more time on your things and not have to worry about their functions that much but i think more fundamentally to the scaling of the business really great leaders are like magnets for talent they raise the bar and then really great people want to work for and work with them and you know conversely if you settle for a good leader like an okay leader 
they're less of a magnet for talent. And guess what? Like talent is super smart and they can tell when someone's not like an A-level leader. And whether you realize it or not, like settling for that person, you are sending a message to your entire company that good is okay. That it's okay to just have someone who's good and not to, you know, hold out for someone that's great. Um, and, you know, in the same way that you need to grow faster than your business every year, your senior leadership team does as well. So I cannot overemphasize the importance of this, you know, in my coaching relationships, you know, once we onboard and kind of kind of get the current state of the union of the CEO and their business and kind of deal with any burning fires, the next thing we turn our attention to is assessing the senior leadership team and figuring out if there are any changes that are need to be made. It's literally the first thing we get to uh, after the initial onboarding. Second is, is to align, so second company practice is to really invest in aligning uh, your leaders and your company. And there's a different difference between alignment and agreement. Agreement is we literally all agree to take the same decision. We all have the same point of view. Alignment is we have these differing points of view and we express them and there's a debate, but then at some point a call is made and we align behind that, whether we fully agree with that decision or partially agree with it or don't agree with it. And the only way to kind of move forward with velocity is to have alignment, you know, versus holding out for agreement because it's hard to get that all the time. And, um, you know, values and mission uh, sort of give us purpose. And I think more than ever, uh, people are looking for purpose. They're looking for meaning. I think this was true even before COVID, but now with COVID and most companies being remote first, talent is more portable than ever. And so I think all else being equal, they want to work for a company that has true meaning, true purpose. And so really making values and mission and vision come to life and be real for your company is, um, is hugely important. Um, I'm gonna talk about values a little bit in a second. I actually find that most, the root cause of most conflict or disagreement in a company is actually unarticulated or conflicting values. And so for most companies, values are just like these cheesy posters that, that we had in walls back when we went in offices and they weren't truly being lived. But I think the companies that really transform, that really scale, the values are lived every day and become you know, hugely important. This is an exercise you could do in your spare time. Here's just like a list of values. It's not uh, exhaustive, but you know, a thing you could do where you circle kind of what's important to you personally, and maybe have your co-founders do the same. And then, okay, how does that align with the values that we have set for our company? And you know, what conclusions do we draw from that? Like, first of all, as a co-founding team, do we have um, complementary uh, and consistent values or are our values totally different? So. You know, here's an example of maybe values and priorities. You know, someone may look be looking to achieve, um, you know, to build a, kind of a market leading company, kind of go quote unquote all the way. And to do that, that person wants to raise capital. Another co-founder may be very happy just building a small profitable business. And there, it's much more about having a nice lifestyle. You can't achieve both. They're, they both want two different things from life and as a result want two different things from the companies. And so kind of explicitly articulating that and capturing that in values up front can save folks um, a lot of time and a lot of heartache. And values ultimately are the things we're not willing to sacrifice uh, as individuals and as a company. They're things that are kind of super important to us. And so I think really spending time to explicitly acknowledge them, capture them, and then live by them is, is really important. Related to, uh, so third pr company practice, and this is very much related to getting alignment on vision, mission, values, et cetera, is to just really invest in communicating. And you know, as your company grows, your job will just more and more be a communications job. You may think it's a nuisance, it's not, it's the job, period, full stop. And you know, when you're in hyper growth mode, 
and you're hiring new people every week, if people haven't heard from you in a month, then there's like a whole chunk of people who've like literally never heard from you. And so as a leader, it's super important to always be reinforcing, you know, why we're here, what matters to us, what are our values, what are our priorities, uh, so that everyone is aligned and kind of approaching decisions in the same way that, that you are. And, and basically, like, if you are sick of hearing yourself saying the same things over and over again, then you may be just possibly communicating enough. Um, that's how high the bar is here. Practice four, you know, operating at the right altitude. Um, many CEOs, when they come to work with me, it's because they're just, they've reached the breaking point and they can't possibly scale anymore and they're just blowing up. And there's lots of reasons for that, uh, but I would argue in many cases they're contributing to this. And, you know, either they are unable to let go of things that they used to do and or going back to what I was saying earlier about the importance of your senior leadership team, uh, they don't have the right leaders in place. And so as a result, um, they are having to get more involved than they should be. And so, you know, Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures uh, many, many years ago articulated what I believe to be just the best definition of the role of a CEO, and I've put it here. It's really just doing three things. First is to set the overall vision and communicate that over and over again. Second is to build the best team possible. I would actually refine that further just to hiring the best senior leadership team possible, i.e. just focusing on the people that report directly to you. Because if you do that and you hire the absolute best possible people for your stage and resources, they will be a magnet that will bring in you know, really great people beneath them. And then the third thing a CEO does is just making sure that they never run out of cash. And so, you know, an ideal world, once you're into scaling, all of your time should be in one of these three buckets. Uh, and if it is, you know, then you truly can uh, scale yourself as CEO. So, uh, which brings up kind of scaling decision making. So, you know, your calendar may look something like this, where it's kind of meeting to meeting. Sometimes you're double booked. There's almost no kind of break time. Uh, and you're working through lunch. And of course, this doesn't even count the extra shift that you put in the evening doing all the emails that you didn't get to during the day. Um, if you are operating at that right altitude, if you're just focused on reinforcing vision, mission, values, if you are focused on building, retaining the strongest senior leadership team that you can and making sure you don't run out of money, your schedule shouldn't look like this. One of the big benefits of investing so much time in communicating vision, mission, values, priorities, is it gives the entire company context so that they can make decisions in a way that is consistent with how you would if you were in the meeting, meaning you don't have to be in the meeting. And so this is you know, something that gives you kind of maximum or just you know, higher leverage. Often I find CEOs are like, you know, back to back in meetings. So let's take, I don't know, product review meetings. And so they're in hour long sessions. But I would argue like a CEO doesn't need to be involved into that level of detail. I think, you know, if any important project, the CEO, I kind of think of a barbell analogy. The CEO should be involved upfront to define what does success look like for this project, for this product launch, whatever it is at the end of the project to, to be the ultimate kind of arbiter of did we achieve those success criteria? But in that middle, the CEO should not be involved uh, unless it's, there's exceptions or issues. So if there really are, if it's well run, you've got the right leadership team, then there's this whole messy middle where the CEO doesn't need to be involved and doesn't need to be in those big hour long mid project status updates uh, as an example. This is, uh, again, related to operating at the right altitude, but an analogy where, you know, how much time are you spending working on the business versus working in the business? So at the beginning, you're working in the business, right? You're writing code, you're selling to customers, you're taking out the garbage, you're doing everything. But over time, as the company grows, I guess, you know, to use a music analogy, right? You go from playing the instrument to being the conductor. And this is the right orientation. And so really maybe just a thing to check in periodically, like how much time am I spending working on the business versus working in? And if I am spending time in, 
you know, looking at that and why, what is causing me to have to work in the business here? Do I have a gap in process? Do I have a gap in people? Or do I just need to change some of my habits and extract myself from that so that I can work as, almost exclusively on the business? Last uh, recommended company practice is, you know, in the same way that you have a roadmap for your product, define a roadmap for yourself as leader. Who do you need to become? What skills do you need to acquire so that you are as relevant a leader 12 months from now as you are today? And some of that's going to come out of, you know, if you've got a financial model and there's a certain scale that's implied in that, uh, maybe there's certain new initiatives that are implied in that, that kind of sets the path for kind of, you know, understanding who you need to become, as well as maybe talking to others, talking to peers, if you're running a 50 person company today, talking to people to run 100 person companies and understand, hey, what happens between here and there? What did you learn? Who did you have to become? Lessons learned, scar tissue, et cetera. There's lots of different sources. You know, we all come in, in all shapes and sizes. And um, is this notion of superpowers. You know, maybe we have this notion of like the stereotypical CEO, the all singing, all dancing, dancing, swashbuckling, charismatic person. And the fact is like CEOs come in all shapes and sizes. And once again, I'll point to Toby as a great illustration of that. You know, Toby was not the original CEO of um, Shopify. He's super uh, introverted. Um, but he has built a company and built a CEO role in his own image by recognizing what he is best at, which is kind of product and technology and long-term vision and not trying to become great at business development, as an example, not trying to be a great public speaker. He has just doubled down on his superpowers. And um, that's definitely a, an approach I recommend for, for folks, you know, hire around your weaknesses rather than investing time to fill them out. You know, I started to try and teach myself how to code back in the day. And then I realized like, I'll never be the best developer. But back when I was operating, I said, I'm gonna double down and become the best possible CFO that I can. Um, so I really recommend kind of, you know, focusing on that and really taking the time to think about who you need to become, you know, one year from now so that you are as relevant then as you are today. Um, and then, you know, kind of wrapping up here, uh, once again, I'll just wrap up with, with Toby. His mantra is, how do I grow 1% better each day? This is a practice he's, he's had for years. If you graph that over the course of a, a year, you know, kind of 200 working days, that's a 7x improvement in your performance. So very, very dramatic. And so a really, really powerful practice. That's it. Thank you so much. These are the various ways to reach me. That was fantastic. Uh, some great insights there. Uh, one of the best ones uh, I've found is uh, you got to grow yourself faster in the business and make time for fun. There's a couple of questions that I want to take and maybe maybe one of them is just coaching. Um, like, you know, you're a leader in the company, but of course you're reporting up and you have a CEO. How do you, how do you coach up, uh, coach the CEO? Um, so Janine, Janine, Janine says, I agree with everything you're saying, but how do you make time for yourself, for fun, for your spouse, for networking when your boss is the CEO, when the CEO demands and the expectations, how do you level set with the CEO in terms of what's doable? And this, this is like the whole venture capital of Silicon Valley scene has created this culture of hustle porn which is a recipe for burnout. <laughs> <Hustle porn>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what yeah. are your thoughts there? What's your advice for Janine? So uh, first of all, like I say, a great talent is more portable, more employable than ever. And so, you know, I talked earlier in, in the chat about how the meaning and purpose of the company are important. But also I would say is qualifying for fit with values and priorities, right? So if you are, if having that, personal time, right? If going hiking on the weekends, actually having time, you know, and boundaries between work and other things is important for you. But in the process of interviewing, you feel like that's not important to the leadership. And in particular, the CEO, you know, culture starts from the top and comes down. And it's not what people say, it's what they do. So if the CEO has no boundaries, and if the CEO is I don't know, had three spouses or like whatever, their life's falling apart, then expect that you're going to be out of alignment. And maybe 
look for companies who have a much better fit with uh, your values. You know, I, I, I really I basically don't compromise on values and priorities fit. You know, don't feel like you like if you join that company and you know going in that the CEO has zero work life balance, don't expect to have work life balance. I find this sort of like this, uh, this sad reality where CEOs are just like overburdened, overwhelmed, have too much on their plate, too much responsibility. And then staff are sitting there dying for like more responsibility. Give me more, give me more work, right? And so it's tragic. And so I think part of the solution to this, even before you've built your senior leaders is like switching gears as founders and like, pushing everything down, even though you might be better at it, the best way for you to grow um, your team is to expose them, help get them to put the reps in, right? You become great at something by being shitty at something and keeping going, right? And so I did the same thing at SurePath, you know, like I was by far the oldest person in my company. I had the most experience. I could have easily built the most accurate models for our companies, but I'd never built a model. I got the team to put the reps in. So I think it's as CEOs, as a CEO, you have to kind of have, you have to recognize that, uh, I don't know, begin with the end of mind, I guess, and recognize that, you know, individual heroics will not scale. So the only way to scale is to invest in growing your team at all levels, not just at the level that directly reports to you, you know, from day one. How do you ensure, like, when you add these senior leaders, right, they're aligned on the culture, how do I identify, like, areas of work before they actually ruin the culture, like, you know, like, no boundaries in sending communication at any time, etc. Like, how do you set these things in place here? Yeah, there's no, uh, there's no substitute for spending meaningful time uh, with, with people, you know, back when I was at FreshBooks, um, I ran biz dev and you know one of our big partners was uh, gusto a payroll company in the us and i spent lots of time with joshua the ceo and whether it was executives he was looking to hire or even vcs that he was thinking of partnering with he would go for like multi-hour hikes with them like he invested really serious time to um, make sure that there was alignment uh, on that dimension and so so that's a big part of it um and then going back to values, right? If you're truly living your values, then um, you need to explicitly discuss them with candidates, with you know potential senior leadership hires, and have them convince you, not just through their words, but through their prior actions at other companies that they live and operate in a way that is consistent with those values. We'll close it out with the last question with Michael, because Michael was the first person to welcome us. Say you're that great talent that could help a CEO. How do you vet that the CEO is the right mindset, has the right mindset like you've described? Is there a telltale sign that this is not a sociopath CEO? I don't know. There's usually pretty telltale signs. If like somebody says I all the time versus we, I did this, I built this product, I raised this money, I achieved this success. To me, that's a massive red flag. I think, you know, versus something talking about, we built this product. You know, so I think where it's all about the individual versus the team, that, that for me is kind of a, a, a red flag, you know, for sure. And, you know, I think you have to really like the person, you know, so you're going to spend, you know, if you're on the senior leadership team and you're reporting to that CEO, you're going to spend more of your waking hours with that person than with your like spouse or partner. Like, I always talk about the Tokyo test. Like, would I get on a flight to Tokyo with this person and like look forward to it or be like cringing and like taking, I don't know, something to like knock me out for 14 hours. Uh, that to me is a telltale test of whether I truly want to work for this person. Yeah, great achievements and companies are a result of many and the best leaders succeed by enabling the success of others. One last question here to close it out. We're a little over the top of the hour. If looking back on your career, what do you wish you did more of and what do you wish you did less of? <laughs> Man, awesome question. I don't know. I, you know it's, it's all been a journey. I wouldn't want to be at any place other than where I am now. Um, you know, ironically, I bought my first book on coaching in 2002. 
but concluded I lacked the gray hair or moral authority to really crush it as a coach. So I kept grinding for a while, but I'm super grateful for being where I am now. And I'm, I'm happy I've been on sort of every side of the equation from an operator to a VC banker and now this. Um, if I was just thinking about dollars and cents, I should have stayed at Shopify. Right? I shouldn't have left to kind of go to real ventures, that's for sure. But still a very happy shareholder at, at Shopify. And um, listen, I think this is my purpose. You know, I was offered CEO roles back when I was operating and uh, turned it down in three seconds flat because I knew how hard it was. And so being at the right hand of a CEO is kind of the reason why I get up in the morning. Um, so there's not much I would change, honestly. Uh, it's been... Uh, you learn from everything, even the failures. In fact, primarily the failures, right? I've been part of, you know, at a startup where we raised 10 million bucks and achieved absolutely nothing. And I learned a lot from that, right? So it's all, it all moves you forward. Awesome. That was fantastic. Great insights. Thanks so much, Mark, Thanks for joining everyone. us. Thank you. I need some traction.